Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Oldfield here with you, and we're glad you are ready for another study from God's Word. We hope that you will take pen and paper in hand and open your Bibles and study along with us. We'll put our scriptures up on the screen. You can follow along with us and study with us, and if you have any questions about what we're saying, just uh, call in, and we'll be glad to have a Bible discussion uh, over the phone with you. And we hope that you will take advantage of this opportunity to study God's Word uh, here by TV, or you can meet with us at 250 the Boulevard on Sundays at 9 and 10 a.m. or Thursdays at 7 p.m. You can reach me at Word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276-340-2653, and uh, we'll be glad to study the Bible with you that way. Tonight, I want to I want you to consider the value of having a discussion with someone and paying attention to what they say. Because you can tell a lot about a person by listening to what they say and how they say it. In other words, if you uh, hear someone talking and they have a strange accent, you might think, well, they're from up north or maybe even from another country. And oftentimes that is a, a very good indicator uh, uh, maybe of something they believe or something that something uh, unique about that person. If you say, well, I know they're from a certain region or a certain certain town or maybe a certain belief, if they came from a certain country, you might say, well, this is a predominantly Muslim country, a predominantly Indian country, so they have, would have these things to believe. And so you can tell that by what they're saying. Now notice this, in Mark 14 and verse 70, Mark 14 and verse 70, <clears throat> you have Peter be confronted by a little damsel girl as he is following Jesus. Jesus has been taken and he's uh, being back and forth tried. And notice what uh, they said. They said, you know, Peter, you're one, of, you're one of these folks that were with Jesus. And he denied it again. And a little, and a little after that, they stood by and said again to, the, to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeth thereto. We know where you're from because you talk like a Galilean. And so your speech can tell you about a person or, or can tell you about who they are or where they're from. Well, the same is true when it comes to religion. You can tell a lot about a person by listening to how they talk or what they say. You know, or you can know very quickly, if they are an individual that studies their Bible, if they are someone that is <coughs> uh, uh, very studious, you can tell if someone uh, spends a, a great deal of time trying to understand the concept of the Bible, the principles of the Bible, by how they talk. Or, vice versa, you can tell that they don't spend much time in the Bible because of what they say. In Acts 4 and verse 13, they took knowledge of Peter and John that they had been with Christ by their boldness with which they spake. So the things they were saying, the way they were speaking, indicated that, hey, they, they had been with Jesus. Well, I submit to you tonight that it's no different when you're talking to someone. And tonight what we're going to do is we're going to look at a, uh, uh, listen to a conversation that took place with a Baptist preacher. And we're going to go through, and I want to help you listen to uh, uh, what is being said so that you can then learn uh, about some things the Bible is saying based upon what the man is saying. In other words, you can learn about what, he's, what he believes, not only by what he says, but also by what he doesn't say. So this is a denomination conversation, and this is going to be typical to any conversation you have with... Uh, uh, probably any of your religious neighbors, they're going to probably say the same things that this man said. Now, the man we're, going, we're talking about is <clears throat> is Craig Bowman. He's a, he's the preacher or the so-called pastor from the First Baptist Church in Eden. And the reason, and like I said, the reason why you need to listen is because he's going to say some things. And what he's saying, as well as what he doesn't say, is is going to really speak volumes. And so I would encourage you, when you're talking to someone... You listen to what they say as well as what they don't say in order to find out just what these people believe and what they're, what they're practicing or what, what they're coming from. So the first thing I want to do is let's just listen to this conversation. This conversation took place actually between uh, uh, Mr. Bowman <coughs> excuse me, and Mark McMinnis. And we're just going to go through and, and I'm going to play it and we'll stop and Take a, uh, make a few comments about some of the things that he said. Let me get my volume turned up here because I know we're going to be uh, needing it. Some of these, uh, uh, some of this clip is very 
quiet, very low, and uh, you, I want to make sure you hear it all. Well, let's start off with this. You know, Jesus prayed for unity Amen. in John 17, oh, yeah. that we all be one. Yeah. And he said that's the way that the world will believe that, that God sent him. Amen. And so all these different brands of religion yeah. um, are man-made, isn't it? That's right. And so you realize that. And so how are we going to remedy that? Well, you know, we uh, attempted... Uh... All right, now, so here it is. Mark said, Jesus prayed for unity. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of times there's a lot of agreement. Yeah, we agree that Jesus prayed for unity. We agree that, yeah, we need to all be together. But we're all different. We're all in these different denominations. And denominations are man-made. Now, the man actually agreed. Denominations are man-made. Division is not God's desire. In John 17, 21, that's what, what Mark uh, made uh, mention of. But in John 17, verse 21, here's, here's Jesus' prayer. He prayed that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so it's the unity of believers that's going to cause the world to go, you know what? These folks are from God. This, Christ is from God because look what he's doing. He's able to bring all these people together from different walks of life, different uh, nationalities, different... Uh, creeds, different backgrounds, and he's bringing them all together. There's going to be unity, and that is that is going to uh, indicate that he is from God. He he's he's a, he's a man sent from God, and so Mr. Bowman agrees. Yeah, yeah, we need unity. It's it's certainly uh, good that that we're unity. So what uh, what is what is your remedy? Paul, uh, Mark says, well, "What's your remedy?" Well, listen to what he says. Here's the remedy. For all the division that man that man made doctrines denominations has produced. Here's what Mr. Bowman says. Here's here's the remedy. We got at least eight churches together and had a major prayer effort this past July over in uh, Freedom Park. Got close to about eight or nine hundred people together for the sole purpose of praying for you. Um, and uh, these are all different denominations, which I felt like was really an inroad and in, recognizing the need to come together. Uh, there are over 400 different kinds of, well, 400 churches in Rockingham County. Right. And uh, in light of that, of course, it just separates people. Exactly right. Uh, and believers, you know, uh, I do believe Jesus prayed and it is better together. The problem is so often sin separates. And it not only separates us from God, but separates us from each other. Exactly. Okay, so his solution, well, you know what? We had about eight or nine, I thought you said eight or nine hundred people, had a big prayer meeting for, for Eden. Now, my friends, think about this. This is what I'm saying. Listen carefully to what's being said here. He agrees that denominations are man-made. Division is not ideal. Christ certainly wants us all together. And so the solution is we had a big prayer meeting. We came all came together, different groups. There's over 400 different churches in, in Rockingham County. Not, that's not different kinds. I'm saying there's different, different groups of people. But eight or nine came together. And here, and here they are. We had a big prayer meeting for, for Eden. But he says we all came together, but yet we're separate because of sin. He said, sin separates us from God. Do we need to play that again? Won't be hard to find. Listen, here he comes again right here. Jesus prayed and it is better together. The problem is so often sin separates. And it only separates us from God, but separates us from each other. All right. So it is better together. It is better together. Jesus is right. Well, I'm glad you acknowledge Jesus, Jesus is right on that. It's better together. But sin separates us not only from God, but from each other. Now let's think about this, friend. This is why I'm saying you need to listen carefully when people talk. They're separated because of denominations. The reason why you look out on Sunday, Sunday morning, Thursday night, Wednesday night, all different times of the day, uh, days of the week, people are co uh, coming together. They're divided, and they're divided based upon man-made doctrines. That's what separates them. 
The, the man actually agreed, yeah, we're all different. We're all different. We're all separated. Unity is better. Together is better. But sin separates us from each other. So, they're separated because of the denominational doctrine. They're separated because of man-made doctrine. And then, but then he says, that's sin. So, he's acknowledging, separated because of sin. But we all came together to pray for Eden. Now, now think about this, friends. A bunch of, so basically what he said, now, now remember I'm saying you need to listen to what he doesn't say as much as what he does say. He said we all came together, we're all divided, we're all using man-made doctrines, and that's not right, that's sin, and therefore we're going to come together and pray. So really... What you're saying is a bunch of sinners came together to pray for Eden? You see what we're talking about, friends? Listen to this. In, in Psalm 66, verse 18. Psalm 66, and verse 18. Listen to what the psalmist said. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now for people to come together admitting that the, that the doctrines that they believe are man-made, that division is a sin, and they're coming together and saying, but we're going to pray for Eden. Do you really think God's going to hear that prayer? You know, you know that you've got sin, you're involved in sin, and yet you think that God's going to hear your prayer? Proverbs 15 and verse 8, listen to what the wise man says. He said, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is the delight. So here you are, here's the contrast here. God delights in the prayer of the upright, but anything the wicked sacrifice is an abomination. Let's look at one more. John 9 and verse, 30, <clears throat> verse 31. John 9 and verse 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now, friends, I'm just, I'm just amazed at what Mr. Bowman said. He said, he agreed, yeah, it's all, all this division is from man. All this division is man-made doctrine. It's what separates us, and that's wrong. Unity is better. But you know what? The best thing we did was y'all came together and prayed. Friends, who, who is going to offer up the prayer to God? Who, who's going to be the one that God hear, is, is hearing in all this? Admittedly, they're all in sin because they're all divided, but yet we're going to come together and pray, pray for Eden? Do you find that hard to believe? I find it very, very, very difficult to believe that they are actually believing that God is going to hear their prayers when they're admitting that they're involved in sin, they're divided up, they're following man-made doctrines, following the traditions of men doing exactly opposite of what Christ prayed for, and yet they're turning around praying for what? If God does not hear a sinner's prayer, John 9 verse 31, which one of these sinners is God hearing who is offering up a prayer for Eden? See? So it's what, it's what is being said, but also... It's what is not being said. Now, he goes on to say, listen to what he says. Exactly right. And, uh, that is tragic. Well, I'm glad you, you recognize that, but you know, um, in James we read that faith without Work. works is, is what? Well, of course it's dead. It's dead. So we, you, we can get all these so-called denominations together and pray all we want to, but if we're not willing to do something about the situation, then it's not going to avail anything. Well, by standpoint, prayer is a doing. It is, in fact, uh, every all right, so he says prayer is the doing. We're all divided, so what, what's going to bring us together is we're all going to pray. Now, now remember what we're saying. We're divided because of sin. Man-made doctrines of sin. That's what divides us. So we're going to get together and pray for unity. Even though we're disobeying God, and that's what's separating us from each other, we're going to get together and pray for unity. But they're not getting rid of the sin. Every time you pray, it's a way that God seeks to fulfill His purpose based on uh, the text. If my people who call on my name will humble themselves and pray and seek mm -hmm. my face and turn their wicked ways, then I will you know, hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and right. land. 
And I do think it begins with prayer. If God's people can start praying together, then maybe some of these barriers can go down. Okay, so he quotes, so he quotes Second Corinthians, uh, Second Chronicles. I'm sorry. Excuse me. He quotes uh, Second Chronicles, chapter seven and verse fourteen. Got too many things open here. Second Chronicles seven and verse fourteen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal the land. Now, here's the observation. Here's the observation. He said unit, prayer, or the beginning of unity, is going to come from everybody coming together and praying. Well, who was at this prayer meeting who was called by God's name. What group was there that was actually basing what they say and do upon God's authority? That's what it means, God's name. Called by His authority. He just said denominations are man-made. He agreed, man-made, not from God, that means not God-made, but no one of them, none of these denominations are called by the God's authority. So who is going to be praying that's going to be, uh, whose prayer is going to be heard by God? Then he said, then my next point is, <clears throat> did they turn from the division? I mean, I, he admitted it was sin. Now, Chronicles said, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So they're all coming together and they're all praying. But did they humble themselves? Did they humble themselves and say, Lord, you know, I, I'm involved in this man made doctrine. I'm going to get out of this man made church. I'm going to drop all these denominations. I'm going to drop all these creeds and catechisms and, and manuals and so forth. And I'm going to turn from my wicked ways of being in the denomination. Did they do that? No. See, there wasn't any true turning there. Not to mention the fact that none of them were God's people to start with. Now, the reason I'm saying this is important to listen to what he's saying as well as what he's not saying is because people will admit something is wrong and then turn around in the very next breath and defend it or say they're going to continue doing it. I find that amazing. I find that amazing. The fact that here is someone who says, well, we're all divided up because of sin, but what we're going to do in order to get rid of that sin and get rid of that division is we're going to come together and pray about it. That's not what caused the division. You know, that's like that government bureaucracy. Here is the one problem that the government has created, and in order to solve that, we're going to create a whole nother bureaucracy over here. When all what it does is just get rid of this bureaucracy. That would take care of the problem. Man comes along and says, we got all denominations. We're all divided up. We're all believing different things, speaking different things, having different judgments on different things. And so in order to have unity, we're just all going to come together and pray about it. Well, as Mark quoted to him, faith without works is dead. Praying and not doing anything is it's not changing anything. It, it's not changing anything. I mean, think about this. God's people are the ones who do His will. So when someone says, well, we're all coming together to pray about it, we're going to be God's people to come together to pray about it. Well, God's people do His will to start with. In Acts 10, verse 34, Acts 10, verse 34, Listen to what Peter says. Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation him that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, which denomination is working righteousness? Which denomination that is by Mr. Bowman's own admission is man-made, which one of those is doing the Lord's will? Can you do the Lord's will 
while you disobey God? Can you sin against God and still be righteous and have your prayers heard? See, it's, it's, it's a contradiction here. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, uh, He that doeth the will of my Father. Everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall I enter the kingdom of heaven. But, who, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, there's a whole lot of people. There's a whole lot of people in Rockingham County. There's a whole lot of people in North Carolina and Virginia. They're, they're claiming to be God's people. They're claiming to do God's will. They're claiming to pray to God. But you know what? He's not hearing their prayers. God only hears the prayers of those individuals who submit to His will and do His will by giving up the doctrines of men that came from the will of man. How can someone sit there with a straight face and say, yeah, we're all part of a man-made church, not God-made, but a man-made church, and yet we're going to come together and pray together, and God's going to hear our prayers. And He's going to be accepting to those prayers. Peter said in 1 Peter 3, verse 12, he said that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to do their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them to do evil. So, when you're, when you're listening to what someone says, and they're, and they're admitting that they're in error and in sin, on one hand, then when they turn around and say, yeah, but we're going to be pleasing to God because we're praying, that ought to be a red flag. In other words, read between the lines here. Listen to what they're saying. They're really not concerned about doing what God says. Because that, in other words, they're having us believe that people in open rebellion to God that are saying, I'm not going to do what you said, Lord. You said have unity this way, and we're not going to do it. We're going to try to have unity by all coming together at the park and praying. Now, is that submitting to God's will? Or following your own wisdom? You know, Thursday night we're studying in Corinthians and it is, it is so amazing about all the times that Paul keeps telling those, those folks in Corinth, your problem is a result of man's wisdom, not God's wisdom. You're following man's wisdom, not God's wisdom. Man's wisdom says, we're going to have unity by praying. And God's wisdom says you'll have unity by putting aside the tradition of men and simply following God's word. How do you expect God to answer prayers of individuals who, who uh, uh, disobey him? Now, let's listen again. Let's listen to something else. Now listen to what Mr. Bowman says. Uh... But who is God's people today? Well, we're going to have to let the Holy Spirit decide. <clears throat> well, He's already decided. Well, I know. But His Word. That's true. <laughs> yeah. But as you know, people pick up that book and they can interpret it many, many different ways. All right. We're going to let the Holy Spirit tell who God's people are. But Mr. Bowman, you are the one who's saying all these people are God's people. If, if, God, if all people that are called by my name will just come together and pray... Wait, you just called all those people God's people. You just called all the denomination that you said were the product of a man-made doctrine. You just said they were all God's people. How then can you then turn around and say, yeah, but we're going to let the Holy Spirit tell us who God's people are? Well, why didn't you let the Holy Spirit tell you to start with? Why didn't you let the Holy Spirit tell you who God's people were before you ever came to the prayer meeting? See? See? Why did you call all these other people together if they weren't really part of God's, uh, God's people? Now the question is, uh, how do we... Well, I think the Holy Spirit is the actual one who brings conviction. So you and I can preach to we're blue in the face. How many times we do preach to blue in the face? The bottom line is, until the Holy Spirit brings conviction, until that conviction falls down upon people, then they're not teachable. And if they're not teachable, uh, well... You, you're, you're casting your bread on the waters. All right, now did you hear that, folks? We're going to let God 
God's word, the Holy Spirit, tell us who are God's people. The Holy Spirit is the one who's going to tell us. He's going to convict people. He's the one who's going to give us the, the conviction. Well, friends, what's the purpose of teaching then? If we're waiting on the Holy Spirit, what's the purpose of teaching? See, what happened here, what you just heard, was you heard Mr. Bowman's Calvinist doctrine come out. You know, you've heard of a Freudian slip. That's really what is happening. He's letting his doctrine come out. That's why I said, if you listen carefully, you'll hear what people believe. He said, well, who's, the, who's God's people? Well, the Holy Spirit's going to tell us. That's right. Because to convict people. And the Holy Spirit is the one who makes people teachable. Did you hear what he said again? Listen again. The Holy Spirit is the one who's going to decide who's teachable and who's not teachable. Yes, until the Holy Spirit brings conviction. The actual one who brings conviction. So you and I can preach to we're blue in the face. How many times we do preach to blue in the face? The bottom line is until the Holy Spirit brings conviction, until that conviction falls down upon people, then they're not teachable. And if they're not teachable, um, well, you, you're, you're casting your bread on the waters. I All right. Until that person's teachable, you know, you're casting your bread on the water. I don't think that's the actual. Uh, uh, illustration he wanted. The Bible says, "Catch your bread and water, and, and it will turn out to me today." So I think he's looking for a pearl before swine. But Mr. Perman, Mr. Uh, Bowman says that the Holy Spirit is the one who makes people teachable. He convicts them. The Holy Spirit convicts them and makes them teachable. Now, friend, this is what this is what I, I you know this is what we tell our brethren. We're, we're teaching them what the Bible says about the, about the Holy Spirit. When you start saying the Holy Spirit does this and does that and does this and does that, the question you always ask is, well, how? Because I'm not so much, uh, I don't so much have a problem with Mr. Bowen saying the Holy Spirit convicts as if, if it's based upon the how. But I know what he believes about the Holy Spirit. He believes the Holy Spirit is going to operate on you and then you can receive the Word. But friends, what the Bible is going to tell us is the Holy Spirit operates in conjunction with the Word. In John 6, verse 17 and 18, this is John 16, verse 7, I'm sorry, John 16, <clears throat> and verse 7, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, how was the Holy Spirit going to reprove the world of sin? Well, the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit coming was to what? It was to guide them into all truth. The whole purpose of the Holy Spirit coming, the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit coming was to guide them into all truth. Verse 13, John 16, 13. How be it when he is the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you to all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So how was the Holy Spirit going to convict the world of sin? By the words that he was given to the apostles, by the words he gave to the apostles. The truth, right, that he guided them into. He was going to give them the words of God, reveal to them the mind of God, and those words were going to convict men of sin. So, does the Holy Spirit convict of sin? Yes. But it is through the preaching of the word. It is through the preaching of the word <clears throat> that men are convicted of sin. How do I know that? How do I know that? Because notice this. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and verse 36, Peter and the other eleven are preaching. You killed the Christ, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were pricked, in other words, quote-unquote conviction fell upon them, when they heard the words. 
Now, Mr. Bowman just said that the Holy Spirit had to fall on them and give them conviction before they're even teachable. That's why I say you got to be careful when you're listening to someone. They'll tell you. They'll let it show them. They'll tell you exactly what they believe. They'll tell you exactly what they believe uh, just by listening to them. So, the Holy Spirit's going to convict? Yes. But he convicts by the Word. He convicts by the power of, of the gospel. Romans 1 verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to save to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel of God was going to save Jew and Gentile. Just one gospel. That's all there was. Just one gospel that was going to convict the world of sin. Notice in Titus 1 verse 9. Titus 1 verse 9. In talking about the qualification of an elder, what's he supposed to be do, able to do? Holding fast the faithful word that he has been taught, that he may by, be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. How do you stop the mouths of the unruly? Verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, Teaching things which they ought not for filthy liquor's sake. How do you stop those mouths? Paul, how do you stop those mouths? By sound doctrine. That's how you convict them. That's how you convince them. That's how you stop their mouths. And so the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is convicting people. Yeah. The Holy Spirit convicts people when they hear the word. Not convicting them before they hear the word. Now that's what I'm saying. When you listen to Mr. Bowman, you can tell what he believes. You can hear very quickly what he believes. Okay? So let's move along. Let's move along. We're having a conversation. We're having a, con a, deno a, a denomination conversation. This is what it's like to talk to someone. This is what it's like to talk to someone who's not a member of the body of Christ and who is not really concerned about the truth. All right, let's move on here. I do believe that ultimately, through faithfulness and trust, God will have his way. But that's where you've got God's sovereignty and man. Listen, I believe what you're doing here obviously is wonderful. You know, uh, we certainly will. The tough thing about this. All right, what we're doing is when we're out knocking doors, that's so wonderful. That, that's so great, but you know what? Don't mess with us. Don't, don't come knocking on our door. We got so much going on, that's what he's going to say. But then listen to what he says. All right? That's so wonderful. We've got bukus of people right here who don't attend any church. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think, boy, this is something what you guys are doing is really a way to connect to folks who are without Christ and people who do not have connection. Well, All right. What y'all doing? What y'all doing is a wonderful way to connect with people who are without Christ. They're not connected to Christ. Oh, this is a great way to connect with them. But not to us. Now remember, folks, who we're talking to. See, sometimes when you're having a conversation, you got to stop and remember, now, this is who I'm dealing with here. I'm talking to a man <clears throat> who's already admitted, number one, he's in a man-made church. And that that is not from God. All right? He's admitted, he's admitted that Jesus prefers unity and that unity is better. Together is better, is what he said. So we're talking to a man that says, I'm disobeying God. I know that I'm disobeying God. I'm not seeking unity the way God seeks unity. So, what do you do? What is he going to tell me to do then? What is, his, what is he going to tell you to do if you're trying to talk to him about these things? He's going to say, well... Focus on someone else. Focus on someone else. Listen, I don't. I, I, I know. I know I'm in sin. I know I'm not doing what God says. I know I'm going to do my own thing. So you know what? You're great. Love you. Go somewhere else. You think that's a, you think that's original? Listen to this in Amos seven, in verse two. Amos 7, I'm sorry, Amos 7 and verse 12. Listen to what Amos was told. Now Amos comes along, if you, read, if you start reading through Amos, 
and especially the first couple chapters, boy, I mean, he's he's laying it out. He's he's laying he's laying a a, a, whoop, a whooping on all these all these uh, nations, Moab, Edom, boy, I mean, he just he's tearing them up, and then he gets to Israel. Then he gets to the northern kingdom, and boy, he tears on them. You fat cows of Bashan, boy, I mean, he he tearing into them. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. This is Amos 7 and verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Oh, Amos is up here. He's stirring up trouble. I mean, the land just can't stand it. I mean, just, oh, just more than we can bear and thus Amos said, saith, Jeroboam shall die uh, by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, oh, that's a prophet, O thou seer, go flee, uh, flee thee away into the land of Judah. And there eat bread and prophesy there, but prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. All right, Amos, you've you've been up here in Israel stirring up trouble long enough. What you need to do? You need to go on back south. You need to go on back home. You need to eat your bread there. You need to prophesy there. But listen, you you need to stay away from Israel. Now you want Mister Bowman saying? Look, look, I've got a good thing here. I'm the pastor of this big church. I'm raking in all the tithes. I've, I've got the, I've got, you know, I've got the brass ring. I'm living the life of Joe here. Boy, I've got it all just right. Tell you what, I'm going to tell you how good of a work you're doing, and I'm going to try to send you on your way. There's a whole lot of people out there that have never even heard about Jesus. They're not connected with Jesus. So why don't you go talk to them? Because we're too busy. We're too busy. Now friends, that's, that's exactly what people are saying. That's what Mr. Bowman saying. See, listen. He didn't say those exact words, but that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Read between the lines. You're condemning me for being in a man-made church and I've even admitted that it's wrong and then he said but so the best thing for you to do is move on long you know what people don't do they don't realize that you're actually helping them out a lot of times when you're talking to someone they don't realize that what you're doing is you're actually giving them some good advice and you're actually pointing them in the right direction and they just don't want to hear it they don't want to see the benefit of what you're saying they only see the loss they don't see the good that can come from it. They don't see the profit that can come from it. They only look at what is lost. Here's a good example. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28. When Jesus was come to the other side unto the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed, of, possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Verse 30. And there was a good and there was a good way off from them, a herd of swine, many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go into the into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep, uh, steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled and went their way into the city and told everything and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. Can you imagine that? Jesus just healed 
these two men that wouldn't let anybody pass by, possessed with these demons, right? And yet the first thing that people say when they see Jesus, you need to leave, please. What? I just healed these. I just healed your neighbors. I've made them uh, uh, upstanding citizens now. You don't have to fear them anymore. They're not causing any problems anymore. Yeah, but see, what you just did was you just sent a whole herd of swine into the sea. It cost us our livelihood. Well, you Jews didn't need to be keeping swine anyway. What were you doing keeping pigs anyway? Trying to help you out. You didn't have any reason herding those, herding those swine. Number one. And number two, what's more important? These men's health, this man's life, these men's life or health, or that herd of pigs? You just need to leave. See, they don't see the benefit. They don't see the good that came from that. They just see, hey, Jesus just destroyed a whole herd of swine. Boy, I tell you what, man, that's a, that's a, lot, of, that's a lot of ham that went out there in the sea. They don't see the benefit. And when you're talking to your denominational friends, like Mr. Bowman, they're not, they're not wanting to look and see the benefit of you telling them, look, friends, you're in a man-made church. Started by men. You know, you know that the reason why we're all divided is because we're all preaching something different, teaching something different, believing something different. So the way we're going to have unity is not by coming together praying, but it's by getting rid of the denominations. You know what? There's a lot of people out here that are not connected with Christ, that are not connected with Christ. Friends, you know what? Our brother Mark was right when he what he said to Mr. Bowman. He said, "Sir." I would say that you are without Christ because you're in a church that Christ never mentioned. Now the Holy Spirit, you see. That's exactly right. Friends, you need to realize he's not connected with Christ. See, when you're talking to someone, they say, well, but what about these people over here? What about you? What about you? Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 48. Matthew 12, verse 48. <clears throat> He answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? In other words, Jesus' mother and brethren came and they said, We want to talk to him. He said, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward the disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Individuals who aren't doing what God says are not connected to Christ. They're not kin to Christ. They're not connected with Him in any way because they're not doing the will of the Father. <clears throat> so when Mr. Bowman says, well, you go ahead and, 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 and get these people that aren't connected with Christ, that's what we're doing. That's what Mark was doing. He was talking to someone who was not connected to Christ. He was in the, he was in the Baptist church that's not in the Bible. By his own admission, it was a man-made doctrine. So why don't you come out? Why don't you come out? Now listen to what <clears throat> Mr. Bowman says next. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's what he says next. He said, you know, the Holy Spirit has to convict you. Right. Well, he's saying. Mm -hmm. Now, the, it's the, the tough thing about that. You know, you and I can sit here and we can go back and forth. You are responsible to Jesus by way of the Holy Spirit and His Word. That's right. And, and so are you. Of course, but what I'm saying to you is that you've got to do what God's leading you to do. Okay. You How am Paul? I not doing that? You remember, you remember Paul? Well, sir, Wait, sorry. I would say that you are without Christ because mm -hmm. you're in a church that Christ never mentioned. Now, the Holy Spirit, you said, you know, the Holy Spirit has to convict you. Right. Well, He convicts through His Word. The Holy Spirit wrote, oh, yeah. wrote these words. Oh, yeah. And so, if we don't read about the Baptist church in mm -hmm. the Bible, you know, shouldn't that... Get, you know, say, okay, this is oh, the Holy listen, Spirit convicting. I am right with you. I, what I would say, though, I would add to that is that any kind of label is wrong. Uh, even the Church of Christ uh, is a label because we have a Church of Christ denomination out here that uses those very words, Church of Christ, and you go and talk to them, and they have their saying. All right, so any label's wrong. See what he did? Mark saying, why are you in a Baptist church? It's not in the Bible. Well, any label's wrong. Any label's wrong. A deflect. See? 
Are you listening? Are you, we having this conversation here? That was a deflection. Not, not really, not really listening. You know, not really taking your point, Mark. I'm deflecting here. What about, what about these other people here who have labels? Every label's wrong. Any label's wrong. Any kind of label's wrong. A friend, is being called a Christian is that wrong? Simply going by the name Christian is is that wrong? I mean, listen to what. Listen to what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves in the, with the church and taught uh, much people and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, is that a label that you're ashamed of? See, we're not talking about labels that you can find in the Bible like Christian. He said, well, you know, there's, there's a group I heard, uh, the Church of Christ, they got their name. Well, Mark, wasn't, Mark introduced himself as a member of the Church of Christ. So he knew who Mark was, and he knew that there's a, that uh, the, the Church of Christ is out here, and the Church of Christ are the ones you're saying. The Baptist Church is not in the Bible. Now, is that a label that, that is wrong? James says, they blaspheme that worthy name by which you're called. James 2, verse 17. The churches of Christ salute you, Romans 16, 16. Now, is that, is that wrong? Is it wrong to be labeled as something that the Bible says you should be labeled as? Is wearing a label that wrong? I mean, if wearing a label that the Bible says should be worn is wrong, well, what about wearing a label that the Bible doesn't say anything about? See? I remember when, when uh, Mr. Uh, uh, I can't remember his first name now, Laws, was on TV. He goes, well, the Church of Christ is only mentioned twice in the Bible. Well, it's actually only one time in the Bible, Churches of Christ. It's only mentioned one time in the Bible, and that's one more than Baptist churches mentioned in the Bible. Why is it you want to deflate and say, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be uh, uh, wearing a label here. Wearing a label here. Friends, listen to what Mr. Bowman will say next. Or later on. Let me skip over here and see if I can get, get to this here. He says, um, let's see, what are five here? happened to carry these labels with us. Jesus carried a label. Uh, he was a Nazarene. Uh, of course, he was a Jew. A lot of people don't like to say that. Uh, he was, in fact, uh, the, the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The issue, though, is that uh, whatever label we carry, we are responsible for Jesus and the Word of God. And I agree with you. Now, I, I, I get tickled at the fact that he keeps telling Mark, I agree with you, I agree with you, but he doesn't really agree with anything Mark said. He said wearing any kind of label is wrong and then said Jesus carried a label. What? Did Mr. Bowman just call Jesus wrong, say Jesus was wrong? When you say wearing any kind of label is wrong and Jesus carried a label, you just said Jesus is wrong. Now, the last part he said, well, but whatever label we care, we're going to be responsible to God for it. You, you got that exactly right. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we'll almost appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in our bodies, whether it be good or bad. If you are in a man-made church, friends, and you're going by the name of a Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, a Lutheran, a Muslim, a Jew, a Pentecostal holiness, those are labels you're going, to have to, you're going to ask for. Why, if you profess to be following Christ, you profess to be a child of God, why would you wear a label that does not identify you as a Christian? Why wouldn't you just say, I'm a Christian? But instead you go, well, I'm a, I'm a such and such and such and such, and, and, and by the way, I'm a Christian. Are you ashamed of that worthy name? Or is it that you're just telling us the truth? You're really not a Christian. So, you're going to wear your labels? You're going to wear your labels? Alright. You're going to have to, you're going to have to uh, uh, give an, uh, an account for it. Now then Mr. Bowman says this. Mark, he starts talking about labels. 
And Mark uh, makes and of course, statement. You know, God is the judge. But sir, you really don't agree with the Bible. I mean, well, when we go to... That's obviously, I disagree with you well, because we, I do believe the Bible. Uh, so, so you're saying we, we, we just assume we're the, the label Mormon or... Oh, no, 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 no. I don't believe that at all. Okay, I now, do believe... You just, you just no, contradicted no, your own you, saying. You misinterpreted what I said. No, sir. <laughs> I said that there are labels around the Christian community that people are Presbyterian, Methodist... Well, Mormons claim uh, to be Christians. I will say I disagree with that. Okay. I, I do not believe okay, that there. So, and there's a lot of... Okay, now wait a minute. Mormons do not get to claim to be a Christian. The Baptists can claim to be a Christian when they're not, but the Mormons cannot claim to be a Christian when they're not. Oh, Mr. Bowman, you just said everybody's going to be responsible for their, for their own label. I mean, which is it? Is it wrong to wear a label or is it wrong to claim to wear the Christian label? Jesus said... Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, shall I the kingdom of heaven? Do so do the, do it the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems to me like Mr. Bowman is kind of uh, being a little judgmental there. He's not even going along with his own message of we're all in this together. We're all going what if some what if some Mormons had showed up at that prayer meeting? I wonder if they could have prayed. Well, Mr. Bowman said, well, your prayer is not being heard because, after all, you're not really a Christian. Is that what you want to say? Now, I will, I will say this. Mr. Bowman is right about one thing. He said the way you find out who's really a Christian is you go to the Bible to find out who's who. That's exactly right. Go to the Bible to find out who's who. Find out who's really a child of God. Got one more. Got just a few minutes left. Let me make this, uh, get to this, this uh, one, one last uh, clip here. Listen to what Mr. Bowman says. He says, Jesus never said convert. Never ask for us to make converts. Wouldn't you say the devils were saved? Jesus never asked for us to make converts. Make what? Converts. He asks Shh. us to make disciples. Okay, Matthew what's the difference? Nights, oh, there's a big difference. Disciples are made. Christians are born. Now, wait a minute. Jesus never said make converts. He said make disciples. But disciples are made and Christians are born. Well, I'd as soon be a Christian then. But here's where Mr. Bowman is showing that he really is not paying attention to what the Bible says. It's true, Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus said, go in all the world, teach all nations. And that word there is, is the word that means make disciples. But friends, do you realize that all through the Bible, for example, in Acts 11 and verse 21, here is what they, were, what, uh, what they did. Acts 11 and verse 21 and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of, of believed and turned to the Lord. That's the word convert. That's the word converted. It's the same word in Acts 3, in verse 19, where Peter says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Yeah, you've got to be converted. You've got to, be, you've got to repent. It's, it's connected with repentance. In Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 8, from Acts chapter 28 and, uh, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 26, I'm trying to get this in here, in verse 18, listen to what Paul said. Paul said his job was to open their eyes to turn them from darkness, there's that word, and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among, uh, <clears throat> among them which are sanctified. Look at verse 20. And I showed first unto them of Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God. There it is. To convert. Be converted. Friends, that's exactly what our job is. Our job is to get people to turn from the error of their ways, being denominations that they admit are not part of God's plan, turn, leave them, and come into the one true church that Christ died for, paid for with his blood, and that is the church of Christ. Friends, I'm out of time. So here's what I want to do. Put my content information up here for you. If I can assist you in any way, 
You can reach me at 276-340-2653. A word from Lord is human Come visit with us at 250 the Boulevard. We'll be glad to see you. Study with you. Anything we can do for you, let us know. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.